Okay, welcome everyone to the third webinar in our Converge to Transform series. Uh, we're excited to uh, have so many wonderful speakers with, uh, here today to talk to us about our urban environmental impacts across kingdoms. And if that's not a clear title, you'll, we'll explain it to you and you will understand it soon. Um, if you haven't been able to watch the first two webinars in the series, they are available on our website, so you can still, still catch them. A couple reminders uh, to get us started. This session is being recorded. Uh, we ask that you keep your microphone muted while the speakers are presenting. Uh, we're going to have a Q&A at the end of all of the talks. And um, the chat will be disabled for now, but that it'll be open then. So submit your questions through the chat and uh, I'll be asking them. After the Q&A, we'll also have a 30 minute breakout session. There'll be four breakout rooms. Um, one for each of our speakers and you'll be able to choose which one you would like to join so you can follow up and, and ask them more detailed questions. I also want to thank everyone who made it possible for this series to uh, come together. First, the speakers that we have today, uh, participants uh, in all four of the webinars uh, from at least 15 different CUNY schools. This number may actually be out of date now that we've had more registrations. Um, the great staff at the ASRC and the Graduate Center who have helped support this event and bringing it together um, and our event sponsors who have uh, made this possible. I want to just briefly say that the ASRC has very recently released its next five year strategic plan after a successful first five years and I invite everyone to take a look at it on our website and review the five goals that we have. Um, and to take the opportunity also to give us feedback on what you see in the strategic plan and what you don't see in the strategic plan. Um, those five goals um, are there to help us realize a much larger vision, which is to improve human, societal, and environmental well being through interdisciplinary science and education. We acknowledge that in order to be able to do this successfully, we must work collaboratively with each other, but also with scientists throughout the university and that we must nurture a diverse and inclusive research culture. Uh, recent events highlight the urgency of addressing systemic social inequities and injustice, and interdisciplinary research has an important role to play in this, both in terms of increasing our understanding of the fundamental problems and in offering solutions that create a more equitable world. In the Converge to Transform, Transform series, we've talked so far about interdisciplinary approaches to address the COVID-19 pandemic and the global need for sustainable, cleaner energy sources. Both of these issues have disproportionately negative impacts on minorities and those in low, lower socioeconomic strata. Today, we're going to be talking about another issue, um, which is focused on environmental, societal, and health issues that emerge in urban centers. And again, we know these have a disproportionate impact on minority and lower, lower socioeconomic communities here in New York City and in urban centers throughout the world. We know there are a number of diseases and disorders that have a higher prevalence in cities compared to rural areas, things like asthma and allergies, which are more common, most likely because of the air quality in urban centers. But there are other disorders where it's less clear what the connection is. So for example, here I'm showing that urban centers have a higher incidence of schizophrenia and breast cancer. Um, and it's unclear exactly what the triggers are that that lead to this. Um, so we're going to hear today about um, some of the some of these disorders and diseases which we see more often in urban centers and what some of the environmental factors are that can contribute to this. It's also too important to stress um, that it's not a one-way street actually it's a, a circle of life even here in the city. Uh, light, air, trees, microbes all impact our health but our activities in turn impact their health. And so we're also gonna be looking at how the health of ourselves as well as the health of other species that we live with and interact with in the city are part of this circle of life. Um, and I just wanna note also to our speakers today are coming to us from biology, environmental science, psychology, public health, um, to share with us an interdisciplinary perspective on the good, the bad, and the ugly aspects of the urban circle of life. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to introduce Patricia Casaccia, 
who is among the many talented scientists I have the privilege of working with at CUNY and at the ASRC. Uh, as a neuroscientist, Professor Kasacha studies glial cells in the brain and how their function to support and communicate with neurons is altered by metabolic as well as environmental signals and that these have uh, effects on brain development and implications for diseases such as multiple sclerosis. So, Patricia. Thank you, Nina. So as Nina already mentioned, we have an exciting event today. And so thank you for all of you for participating. And we have this intriguing title, Urban Environmental Impacts Across Kingdoms. So as the title implies, we will discuss the effect of urbanization on different biological kingdoms. And from our keynote speaker, Dr. Sandro Galea, we will hear uh, about the impact that cities have on the health of human populations. From then, we will have uh, three different speakers from our CUNY campuses, representing actually three distinct boroughs. We'll have Andrew Reinman from uh, um, CUNY Hunter and the ESRC, so I can see him as a representation of Manhattan, who will discuss the effect of urbanization on environmental variables, including city streets, uh, uh, city trees in terms of parks and streets. Then we will have Monica Trujillo from Queens, Queensborough Community College, who will discuss the extreme effects of urbanization on the soil microbiota. And it's going to be very exciting to hear her talk and this idea also of crosstalk among different species. And, and then we will have Erica Niwa from Brooklyn, from Brooklyn, Community, from Brooklyn College and Brooklyn College Community Partnership, who will address very current issues of racial justice and social inequalities and propose innovative straight strategies which bring research in psychology and education and service to try to provide new transformative solutions. And with this, it is really my distinct pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker today, Dr. Sandro Galea. Sandro is a physician and epidemiologist and author and is the Dean and Robert Knox Professor at Boston University School of Public Health. He holds a medical degree from Canada, the University of Toronto, graduate degrees from Harvard University and Columbia University, and an honorary doctorate from the University of Glasgow. Prior to his academic career, he practiced emergency medicine in Canada. He served in Somalia with Doctors Without Borders and conducted research all over the world. He also held academic and leadership position at Columbia University, University of Medicine, the New York Academy of Medicine. Currently, he is chair of the board of the Association of Schools and Programs of Public Health and the past president of the Society for Epidemiologic Research and of the Interdisciplinary Association for Population Health Science. He is an elected member of the National Academy of Medicine and has received several Lifetime Achievement Awards. Dr. Galea's main research contribution is the health of urban population with a focus on the causes of brain disorders, in particularly common mood anxiety disorder, substance abuses. And he has published extensively about social epidemiology, health inequalities, and the health of vulnerable population and has had a particularly interest on the consequences of mass trauma and conflict worldwide. He has published extensively in the peer review literature. Uh, he has over 800 scientific publications in PubMed, 50 book chapters, 18 books. His work has been cited more than 60,000 times, and he has published several books on this concept, on the concept of urban health. Today, we are really excited to have him with us, and the title of his talk is Cities and the Health of Population in a Post-COVID World. Thank you so much, Sandro. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Casaccia, for inviting me, and uh, thank you to the program for having me join you. Let me share my screen before I get going. You can see that okay? Good, very good. So, um, Thank you for having me. As uh, Professor Casaccio said, I've had uh, an interest in this topic for a long time, and uh, I, um, I changed the title slightly to put it in the time of COVID in the parentheses, um, just because, of course, we're going through a time where everything is in a time of COVID, which is, which is fine and understandable. But 
I'm, I'm broadly, as you might expect, going to talk about cities and health more broadly and more generally and in a more timeless way. But I will make reference to how I think this has particular implications for how we think about cities in a time of COVID. Now, I'm going to speak about health. And I realize that uh, many on this audience do not think about health, human health, as a uh, part of your uh, day to day. So I thought I would actually frame a little bit for a second what we mean by population health, because I do think that a lot of this conversation depends on how we understand population health. So I wanted to start with that. And I want to start with a population. This is a population, a population of, a, of a gray people. When most of the health literature and most of the conversation about health in the public media focuses on people in the corner, sick people, people who come and interact with the healthcare system or the sick care system. That is not what I'm talking about here. I am treating people as interspersed in a population and to think about health as generated by environments, in this case by urban environments, and disease as being manifest by people who are within that urban context. That is a very different perspective than focusing only on a few people with disease metaphorically in the corner, and it helps understand why we should care about cities when we think and talk about health. Ultimately, what we're trying to do is create environments, in this case, urban environments, that are health conducive, that are health generating, and in doing that, reduce the number of people with disease in populations. So it's a, it's a directly different approach than the approach of treating only a few people who are already sick, who are a segment of the population, to an approach that says, let us understand health within context and create a context that can help. Now, this approach that I just suggested, I suspect that uh, even those of you who don't think about health on a day-to-day -day basis, you've heard what I just said, and at this point you're having a bit of a nod and saying, okay, that's fine, uh, that's obvious, why is he telling us? Okay. Well, it may be obvious, but it's actually different than how we approach health on a day. Oh boy. How the world approaches health. So, um, our dominant approach to health is explicitly an individual based approach to health. The entire precision medicine, personalized medicine, individualized medicine agenda that has dominated biomedical research for the past 20 years is just one expression, one manifestation of that. It is an approach to finding ever better approaches to individualize genetic or molecular markers to help me understand my health and you understand your health, which is a different approach than us understanding context that shapes all our health. That, of course, is what has driven our extraordinary health spending. This is health spending in the United States. That's us. These are all the other rational high-income countries. They're all trending together. And this is us with our, with our health spending being 40% higher than the next closest country, which in this case right now is about Switzerland. That reflects directly our overwhelming investment in treating the health of individuals who are sick with an approach in my prior slide of dealing with the people in the corner rather than thinking about populations and restoring populations to health. As a result of that, we have created this picture. We as a country have lagged behind on health. So if you look at this graph, this is life expectancy. I like this graph, uh, this is from um, um, Washington Post, I believe, because it's called American exceptionalism, ironically. Um, um, you see that we're in the middle of the pack in 1980 in terms of life expectancy, but look what's happened in the past um, 40 years. You see how we are now behind on health? We are now four to five years lagging behind on health compared to our peer countries. That is despite the fact, what I showed you a slide ago, that we spend far more than anybody else on health. The reason for that is squarely because our approach to health has been one of promoting the health of individuals forsaking the health of populations. I can show you any number of health indicators that shows that we are last, we are worse on health than other peer countries. This is a, a non-communicable disease rate and you see the US on the right where our rate of non-communicable disease is higher than those of other countries. Now, those of you on this call who uh, read about this and think about this or you know, sort of follow the, nat the, the national media on this will know this and this is uh, understood. But what's not well understood is this, that this is life expectancy again, the red dot is the US. This wasn't always like that. It is not a natural law that the US should be spending more on health and get have worse health as a result. In 1980, which is really just 40 years ago, we actually were in the top half of health. Here, life expectancy, these are other high-income countries. And you see how over the past 40 years, we have now drifted to the very bottom. 
So sometimes I feel like we have a fatalism about this. We have a fatalism about this that says, well, we understand this is many complicated issues. It's complicated. There's lawsuits, there's doctor's fees, et cetera. And uh, why we spend so much on health. And yes, our health outcome is not so good, but it's complicated. Well, yes, it's complicated, but somehow we knew what to do about this 40 years ago and we've forgotten what to do in the past 40 years. When you map, this is my favorite or least favorite slide, depending on how you look at it on this, is uh, here you're mapping life expectancy by cost. And what you see is all the other rational countries, you spend more money, you get more life expectancy. And the US, you spend more money and you get less out of it. So it's like we are failing to thrive. We fall off the curve compared to our other peer countries. And why is that? That is simply because we have shifted in my initial paradigm from thinking about the context and how that generates our health to thinking only about spending ever more and more money on a subgroup of people who are sick. And that is an expensive proposition that is very low yield. Just to make this case in terms of how we should be thinking about health, I thought I would share a quick story. This is Blind Willie Johnson, who was a blues man. He, uh, we remember him today because about 36 of his songs were preserved. He was born in Texas at the turn of the 20th century. He was born sighted, but when he was seven, he was a victim of a domestic violence incident. Acid was thrown in his eyes and he became blind. He became blind. He was poor, blind, black in Texas in the beginning of the 20th century, made a living busking. And uh, he got married. Him and his wife were living in a small house, which burned down, but they didn't have any money to fix their house. So they, kept, they went back and were living in the burnt out shell of the house. In the 1940s, when he was in his 40s, blind Willie got malaria. Now, this is Texas in the 1940s. Malaria was common. It's nothing unusual about him getting malaria. And his wife took him to hospital and he was turned away from hospital. Now, it's not clear if he was turned away because he was poor, because he was blind, or because he was black. And then he died. Now, why am I telling this story? Because the question is simple. What killed blind Willie Johnson? Well, what killed blind Willie Johnson was malaria, right? I told you he had malaria, went to hospital, didn't get treated, and he died. But the reason I tell you the story is because every rational human being listening to the story says, well, it wasn't just malaria that killed him, let's face it. It was also domestic violence, it was poverty, it was racism, it was homelessness. All of these forces also killed him. Our metaphorically, our metaphorical approach to the blind Willie Johnsons of the world, and blind Willie Johnson is all of us, is that we keep spending all our money on malaria. That's where we spend all our money. Now, I want to be clear, this is not an either or argument. This is an end argument. Obviously, we also need to be investing in malaria for when we get malaria so we can get sick. But when I tell the story, I have yet to have somebody raise their hand and say, I actually think we should ignore all the other forces, ignore homelessness, ignore poverty, ignore racism, ignore access to care. Let's just treat the malarious when they happen. Because intuitively, we all understand that is a highly ineffective way of operating, not to mention in direct contravention with any principles of fairness and social justice. But leaving that aside, it is an expensive, ineffective way of dealing with the problems of health. And this is what a health approach in populations does. It says, let us understand homelessness, the racism, the social justice issues, the access to care issues that affect all our lives. And this is why thinking about cities and health becomes so important because cities create a context that can shape these kind of conditions. Now, here's what we do. On the left is the bar of roughly what causes health. Health medicine, access to care is about five to 10%, genes 20%, our environments 20, 25%, our behaviors 30, 40%, and then a bunch of other stuff. That's what causes health. This is what we spend our money on. 90% of money we spend on medicine. Now that is true more or less everywhere in this country. Now many of you are in New York right now. I, I lived in New York for 10 years of my life. Right now I live in Massachusetts. So two uh, progressive states. And uh, sometimes in Massachusetts, Massachusetts has a, has a, a uh, holds itself in high esteem. Sometimes Massachusetts, and I show this Massachusetts, people say, well, that's not us. Maybe that's in Mississippi, but it couldn't be Massachusetts. So usually I show this slide. This is the change in Massachusetts spending in the past 15 years. 80% increase on medicine, decrease or staying the same, increase primary, secondary education, law and public safety, mental health, public health, higher education, early child education, environment and recreation. So you see that even in Massachusetts, arguably the most progressive state in the, in the union, we are explicitly moving more in this approach, focusing on the individual, less focusing on context that ultimately shapes our health, which is of course why I am here and why I actually feel passionately about this message. Sometimes I feel, like our entire health conversation is characterized by this. This is a um, 
formerly famous soccer player, Mario Balotelli, an excellent soccer player who was Italian. He um, um, was playing with Manchester City at the time, which is a big Premier League soccer team, and he scored a lot of goals. And when he scored goals, he uh, would lift up his shirt and show this picture that says, why always me? Which of course is uh, brimming with arrogance and hubris. Um, uh, but the instructive part about this, of course, is that when Mario Balotelli left Manchester City, he stopped scoring goals because really what the simple thing he forgot is that part of scoring goals, of course, is his own talent, but it was in large part because he was playing on a great team, including by the man to his left, who was David Silva, who was always passing him the ball. And this is what we forget about health all the time. My health is about me. I don't need you. I don't need any of you. It's just about me. And then you realize actually that's false because our health ultimately is a product of the world around us. Now, this is where cities come in. This is why cities become interesting. Half the world's population lives in cities. Another 2.5 billion people are going to be added to urban populations by 2050. Six billion people are going to be in cities in the world in 2050. Everybody on this call was alive in the world when just a few years ago when there were 6 billion people in the world, period. By 2050, there will be 6 billion people in cities alone. And cities are, represent this. This is my, my metaphorical pet goldfish where, who I want to be healthy. And I say to my goldfish, exercise, swim around the bowl 10 times clockwise, 10 times clockwise every day. Don't eat too much of little flaky food so you don't get uh, overweight. And my goldfish can still die, despite me bringing in the goldfish doctor, if I forgot to change its water. The water is the world around us. And for more and more of us, the water is the cities in which we live, which is why cities matter so much to our health in a time of COVID or in a time of non-COVID. Here's a perfect illustration on this. These are data from China. Uh, looking at the percent of urban population and the increase in life expectancy. The more urban China is, the higher the life expectancy. But what's particularly instructive about this graph is the slope. This line is 1990, the orange line is, 20, is 2000, the light green line is 2010, the dark green line is 2015. As time passes, the urban advantage to health is getting more and more. It's getting steeper and steeper. Being in cities is generating health more and more, which means that there, this simple illustration shows the potential of improved urban context to improve health. And ultimately, how does that work? Well, it works through a nested set of influences, through the policies we institute in cities, the institutions within which we live in cities, the qualities of the neighborhoods, our living conditions, our social relationships, our risk factors, all of which interacts with our genes and our pathophysiologic pathways. There is nothing, nothing earth chattering about that. But once you understand that, and once you understand the structures within the cities that can generate health, once you understand my framework for thinking about the health of populations that I just articulated before, sorry, it's not my framework, it's the framework for thinking about health of populations, you understand that there is a tremendous opportunity to act here on cities to then generate health in populations. Now, let me now hone in. As you can see from my talk, I started wide. I'm sort of moving in narrower and narrower. What is it about cities? So what are the elements of cities that then generate health? And I could spend hours and hours and hours talking about that, as I'm sure could many of you. But I just want to focus on four large determinants, four buckets of drivers that could help inform our understanding of health in cities. Number one, spaces. Cities are about spaces and they're human made spaces. And what is, what is important about everything about cities is that ultimately human made. Once you understand that the world around us is the water in which we live, then you realize that, well, we can change that water, we can change cities, and we can, as a result, create health of populations. Spaces. This is a picture in Bangladesh, giving you a sense of the characteristics of the built environment. How do, why does this matter? In a time of COVID, when we know that physical distancing um, matters, when I, I imagine all of you on this call have spent a large part of the past several months sheltering at home, sheltering in apartments in New York or sheltering outside of New York, how would you shelter in place in a place like that? How would that type of urban environment actually encourage you and um, protect you from COVID? You can immediately see that the built environment, the quality of our spaces is determinative of our health in many dimensions not to mention in a time of COVID. Um, COVID has had the, the um, biggest outbreaks of um, coronavirus infection, which really suggests then how important it is that we have the kind of physical spaces to mitigate the spread of disease like this, because any other infectious disease is always gonna spread first in the city just simply by virtue of our population density. Parks and recreation. 
So we can talk all we want about obesity and obesity being a huge uh, epidemic, but uh, park and recreation cre parks create opportunities for physical activity, absent which, absent which we have no means really to deal with the caloric balance that ultimately um, uh, influences obesity. So A is spaces, B, assets. The assets we have matter always for our health and they matter more within the urban environment. Within urban environments, assets are protective to buffer us against the stressors in the urban environment and they also shape and color the divides that are between us, that are between groups characterized by socioeconomic divides as well as uh, racial ethnic divides. Cities are becoming quickly cities of health haves and, of haves and have nots. Here you see the GDP of 22% of the richest cities control more than 54% of the GDP of the world, which is result in the accumulation of assets and resources in the hands of relatively few cities. Wealth is one core asset. The accumulation of wealth, this is the Ambani Towers, which is uh, of the richest family in India, in um, 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 uh, Bombay. And, uh, the, um, and wealth is stratified within cities, creating um, uh, enormous differences in our health. This is a, a very simple slide about uh, the time of COVID, looking at uh, movement, population movement. In other words, the drop in movement and putting people at risk for COVID-19. Look at this. So March 8th, March 10th, is um, when um, the pandemic hit broadly in the, in the Northeast of the US. And uh, you see the decrease in mobility by people in cities. And look at this, the blue is the wealthiest and the orange is the poorest. It's a three day difference in uh, when people actually slow down, the, stop their mobility, which of course makes an enormous difference in risk of transmission of COVID at the peak of a pandemic. And here's another illustration. This is from a paper that's under review um, from my team where we looked at the intersection of assets and stressors um, uh, to look at the burden of mental illness after COVID in populations. And what you see here is the group on the far right, which has low assets and a lot of stressors, is the group with most depression, not surprising. The group on the far left with high assets and low stressors is the group with least depression, it's not surprising. But what I want you to look at is having assets and experiencing a lot of stressors is the same as having no assets and having no stressors which really, I think, illustrates this nice balance that uh, in cities, assets buffer us against stressors. Unless we have assets, we are vulnerable, enormously valuable, vulnerable to having to the stressors of urban life. Education is another asset of urban living that can create pathways towards good health in urban living. Um, the environment obviously is an asset. Living in a place which is uh, which is generative of uh, poor health, generative of uh, poor respiratory health is, uh, a, uh, is an asset, it's a resource to your health. And health systems, which are also an asset, having access to stable health systems. This is uh, from a hospital in Johannesburg, South Africa. And having, having assets that allow you then to buy yourself health system access when you need it. Food, another asset within cities, having access to a healthy or non-healthy food. So that's assets. Now stressors. Let me talk about stressors, third determinant. Um, family stressors, the stressors of um, housing and adequate care of children is a stressor that both uh, haunts urban dwellers, it results in tremendous urban divides. And poverty, poverty, and uh, which is of course the flip side of having wealth in the asset, in the asset side of the house is poverty. And this is in, um, in DACA um, and the attendant stressors that go with that. And of course, in the US in the time of COVID, this is the drop in consumer spending, the precipitous sort of a waterfall drop in consumer spending that has plunged 36 million Americans newly uh, declaring uh, uh, unemployment, uh, filing for unemployment insurance, uh, in, uh, which was the largest ever single increase in an unemployment uh, uh, request since the uh, Great Recession. Now there's been some uptick in that, which we'll see where that goes. And this goes back to depression. I just want to show you this. This is. Uh, depression in the general population. The blue is a population before COVID and the red is after COVID. What you see is a lot more people had no depression before COVID. Now this is during COVID. And now look what's happened. We have more and more people with mild, moderate, severe, moderately severe and severe depression during COVID. Housing is a typical urban stressor, particularly given the, uh, the range of um, affordable housing. And there's something called the housing gap, which about a third of cities in the world have 
which is essentially an unaffordability of their housing for a majority of their population. And segregation and racism. And uh, cities are uh, places that are highly segregated. There's a picture in, South, in uh, South Africa, looking at just across a highway, you have a wealthy neighborhood and you have a much less wealthy neighborhood physically visible. I show this picture from South Africa because sometimes I think uh, we think, well, then that's South Africa. But then um, uh, this is of course what's happening right now in the United States. And this is in part why that's happening. This is Detroit, this is Eight Mile Road. Detroit I was in Michigan for a while, so that's, um, it was my hometown for a while. And this is whites and blacks. Whites are green, blacks and blue. And you see essentially the exact same picture we see in South Africa with this dramatic segregation over one road. These are the stressors that characterize American cities. And occupations, occupations bring with them stressors and assets, not only the money that occupations buy you, but uh, this is a picture from Cairo. And uh, for the people who drive the buses, you can imagine the stressors that go with that. And the fourth determinant I want to talk about is social connections. Social connections in cities. So talk about spaces, talk about assets, talk about stressors, and talk about social connections. Um, isolation in cities, which is, uh, we know it's a real uh, concern, particularly for uh, groups that are highly migrant, like Latinx populations in New York City, uh, that um, particularly Latinx men in, uh, in, um, from Central American countries in New York City, uh, you have a lot of isolation, which is associated with poor mental health. And that is, um, is uh, from a recent um, paper that uh, looked at the um, decreased mortality associated with, with several factors. So this is social relationships. These are social relationships, high versus low, and measures of social integration. All I want you to see is that the protective effect of social relationships is bigger than not smoking, ceasing smoking, not consuming alcohol, getting the flu vaccine, cardiac rehabilitation, exercising, being lean versus obese, being treated for hypertension, and low versus high pollution. I'm often asked in my public speaking anyway, uh, if there were to be one thing I would do, what would be the magic wand? What would I do with magic wand? And the answer is very simple. I would actually promote social connections. I think it is the most protective, easily manipulable, easily improvable characteristic within our environments, within our urban environments. Culture, much harder um, uh, to think about, but it's part of social connections. Much harder to think about how to fix culture, how to change the culture around things like masks, for example, is Hong Kong. Um, so I think those four, if I were to think about cities and organize my thoughts about cities, and I could create any number of conceptual frameworks, I've published conceptual frameworks, I'm sure several of you have as well. Think, think about spaces, thinking about assets, thinking about stressors, and uh, thinking about social connections, represent a universe of determinants within cities that are, I think, sufficient for our thinking about how can we create cities that are healthy in COVID time and non COVID time. I want to end by looking forward talk about trends. So where are cities headed? What are the major trends in the world that are shaping how we think about cities that will be shaping what this conversation, this exact conversation, what will it be like 20 years from now, 50 years from now? So urbanization is the dominant part of the conversation. So, so urbanization is the right conversation to be having. I already showed you some data about how city living is going to increase, but you know, just to drive it home for a second. New York City, where I presume um, all of you are, is um, the population of New York City is larger than the population of 38 US states. That's the population of New York City. They're just to give you a grounding on the force and the impact on urbanization. So, you know, Mayor de Blasio, who's currently under a lot of stress, um, uh, they, uh, I'm not sure about the extent to which his assets mitigate that, but be that as it may, um, uh, he is, in his defense, he is actually the mayor of a city that's larger than 38 US states. So this is the kind of concentration of cities that we're going to see more and more. So trend one urbanization, trend two population aging. Populations are aging and uh, that creates enormous opportunities and also enormous challenges. This is a um, simple map of the world, 2015, darker the color, the, the higher the proportion of people age 60 or older, that's 2015, that's 2050. Just to give you a sense of how the world is going to change dramatically in the next 50 years. We are going to have, by the way, a couple of years ago, we, we crossed the threshold. We had more people over age 65 than we had uh, children under the age of five. So there are in the world, more people over age 65 than our children under the age of five. And that is going to be two thirds more by the time we get to 2050. So this is a world that is a different composition than the world we have now. And these issues, these issues of spaces, spaces have to change if we're going to promote health in cities for people who are over 65 than under the age of five. Issues of connections become different. Issues of assets become different. Issues of stressors become different. So these trends intersect with all the domains that I talked about earlier. Migration, population migration. This is from uh, 
a uh, camp in uh, Syria. And um, all I want to show you here is uh, migration is happening from all countries all over the world, principally from low income countries, of course, but also involves high income, lower income, middle income countries. And migration has been inc increasing, changing in patterns over time. But we are creating a world where migration is more and more common. And of course, that runs in direct counter with the populist, nativist, and xenophobic current national conversation that tries to other people, particularly try to other migrants, and that runs directly with the interests of health. Climate change, global environmental climate change, the four changes, the gate of India and Delhi, um, uh, which you can hardly see with the, with the um, um, pollution, but the change in climate is, affects all sorts of manners of uh, our health, particularly intersecting with cities. This is the number of people affected by disasters in the past uh, 40, uh, 30 years. The blue is number of people affected, the, or the red is a best fit line. You see more and more disasters are happening. And when I show that slide, sometimes you know, I ask, well, is it why? Why are disasters happening more? Is it an act of God? God is less happy with us? No, it's not because she's less happy with us. It's very simple. We are packing more and more people in cities and cities are built next to water. Climate change, meteorologic events, water, disasters. And that's what affects more and more people with disasters every day and with more and more damage. That's number of damages and number of disasters again. This is China, which by the way, is the country which always has more and most, more, most disasters. And all I want you to see is the darker the color is more people affected, um, uh, but more affected by disaster and the dots are where cities are. All the disasters in China happen where there are a lot of people. So I, I wanna end here. I've talked about four characteristics of cities. I've talked about um, that matter, I think four trends, which is urbanization, migration, climate change, population aging. And I think those are the forces that are gonna shape health over the next uh, over the next multiple uh, decades of years. And I'm on to end on this because I do realize that, that the uh, narrative I'm giving you runs counter to the narrative of what produces health. And I do realize, and uh, when, uh, when I was approached to this talk, my question was, well, does anybody want to hear my talk given the universe that many of you are in in the realms of science? And uh, because I do realize that I'm approaching science from a population health science perspective, which is different than what a lot of you do. And I want to show you this. Now, what is this? This is a picture by Cornelis de Hode, and this is a picture of a kangaroo. Now, you all know it's not what a kangaroo looks like, but Cornelis de Hode did not know that. Cornelis de Hode was an artist, and he never saw a kangaroo, but sailors um, uh, from uh, Amsterdam had gone to Australia, seen kangaroos, and they came back. And they told him stories of this magnificent animal, which had long, long neck, carried its babies in a pouch, and had strong arms. And he drew what he heard. Of course, now you can imagine how you would draw that too, if that's what you heard, even though it looks nothing like a kangaroo. Why am I telling you that? I'll tell you that I think our understanding of health is often like the drawing of the kangaroo. We see it through a very particular lens and it's time to shift our lens. And I think cities gives us an opportunity to think differently. Anybody's interested is a range of the books, which I've done, which I was mentioned earlier. And that's uh, me. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you for including me in your conversation. It's a privilege to be here. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sandra. That was really wonderful. And, and I think um, a really great way to, to, to kick off this webinar um, and a very timely uh, topic as well. And I will have questions for you during the question and answer session for sure. Um, next up, uh, we have uh, Andy Reinman, who is an assistant professor in the Department of Geography at Hunter College and in the Environmental Sciences Initiative at the ASRC. Um, he received his PhD in biology from Boston University, and today he's going to talk to us about how life in the city impacts urban trees and forests. Great. Thanks for the introduction. Okay, do you see my slide okay? Okay, great. Um, so that was a wonderful talk to start out this session with and I feel like it covered a lot of different topics that we're all sort of thinking about and gonna be talking about uh, moving forward with today. And so the little piece that I wanted to talk about was um, sort of the, the woes and windfalls of city life for our trees in, in urban areas. And, and like what was you know, mentioned in, in the previous talk, um, it seems that there's sort of these woes and windfalls for our human populations in urban areas as, uh, as well. 
Um, and I'll finish up with some maybe brief discussion on the possible overlap there. But before I really jump into the nitty gritty, I figured um, I should start off with sort of what I mean when I talk about the urban forest or um, really what we generally refer to as the urban tree canopy. And this is composed of three major components. First is the street trees, right? These are the trees grown along all of our roads um, that we're all probably pretty familiar with in our day to day life. But the urban tree canopy also includes the trees in our planted that are planted in parks. This is uh, Union Square Park and also the trees that exist in our natural forest. So here's an image from Van Cortlandt Park up in the Bronx. And so why, why do we think and care so much about trees in our urban areas? And some of the reasons for this really lie in the variety of different, what we call ecosystem services that the urban tree canopy provides us. And so what do, what do I mean by that? So some of these services that we're all probably pretty familiar with include things like uh, the urban tree canopy providing habitat um, and helping to enhance biodiversity in our urban areas. Um, as we are probably even more aware of now during the COVID pandemic, these are really important resources for recreation and just sort of aesthetics and sort of mental health. Um, but they also play really important roles in helping to dampen noise pollution. As an example of this, I encourage you all to sort of find the depths of Inwood Hill Park, and that's probably the only place in Manhattan where perhaps the sounds of nature are a little bit louder than the sounds of humanity. Um, and and the, these trees in our urban areas are also really important for helping to maintain water and air quality and to regulate water flow. Um, and another really important aspect of our urban tree canopy that um, gets a lot of attention is its role in climate regulation. Um, and this is sort of the part of the urban tree canopy and the ecosystem services they provide that, um, that a lot of my work is, is focused on. So I will focus on that a little bit more here as well. And so what I mean by climate regulation is that trees in our forests play a really important role in carbon sequestration. So by removing CO2 from the atmosphere, they help to slow rates of climate change. Um, but they also play sort of a, a little bit more of a direct role in thermal regulation. And this is largely through their capacity to uh, mediate surface energy dynamics. So um, these are things along the lines of shading and transpiration, so the movement of water from soils to the atmosphere. Uh, I'm sure we're all aware, especially maybe on a day like today, that if you walk around outside, you start sweating a little bit, you feel a nice breeze come across, um, and that sweat that's on your arm evaporates, there's a nice cooling feeling. And so we can sort of think of trees as doing the same things and almost like being the, the sweat glands of our, of our landscapes. Uh, and then also by cooling sort of the buildings that they're near, they can help to reduce energy demand and that in turn reduces our carbon emissions. And so like I mentioned, I'm going to focus a little bit today on this climate regulation piece. Um, and I'm going to pro provide a, a couple of examples of this um, from some of our work in uh, Westchester County across the whole county. And then also I'll, I'll, I'll bring it back to New York City as well. So over the past year and a half, we've been doing some work using um, satellite imagery. So a lot of different uh, sources of data that we get from, from satellites and other sensors that are mounted to the International Space Station that tell us a lot about sort of vegetation cover at the Earth's surface. And then through the use of thermal radiometers, we can also look at what the temperature is at the Earth's surface. And so this panel on the left is sort of the distribution of canopy cover across Westchester County. So this is the combination of what we would more traditionally think of as forests, as well as sort of the trees that we plant along our streets and in city parks. And on the right is spatial variations in surface temperature. And so the warmer the colors indicate areas that are hotter, the greener the color indicates areas that are cooler and you can pretty clearly see that you know these more heavily urbanized areas like Yonkers down here at the bottom uh, are a lot hotter than the more rural less developed more forested higher canopy cover areas in the uh, northern and northeastern part of the county. Um, and when we look at this sort of at a municipal level, we can see, see this really tight relationship between how cool a municipality is, these data are just from June, so this is an idea of a summer temperature, relative to the proportion of the landscape that's covered with, with canopy. So a really effective way to help to cool our cities and to cool our landscapes is to plant more trees. Um, if we look at New York City, we can see these same patterns play out. Um, so 
all these green areas on the panel on the left, those are the cooler parts of the city and those are really closely correlated to where we have all of our urban parks and areas of high canopy cover. So again, even uh, in a place as urbanized as New York City, just having these places where we have more trees can play a really important role in cooling things off and almost providing like some sort of a, of a refuge from heat during hot summer days. Uh, but it's also important to recognize that the capacity of trees to cool our urban landscapes and perform the other ecosystem services that, that we uh, rely on them pretty heavily for is likely very closely tied to the health and vigor of these trees. And this is important because by virtue of creating an urban landscape, we do a lot to alter the environmental conditions and the growing conditions of the trees that live there. And so I put together this table just to give you a, a brief overview of some of the things that change and the direction that they change in an urban landscape. So for example, uh, things like air temperature can increase dramatically when we produce a city. So New York City, for example, is about four or five degrees Celsius warmer than it would be if it weren't such a massive city. Um, and, but the trees in these urban landscapes also experience greater amounts of physical damage. They're typically growing in areas with higher amounts of soil compaction. Uh, their exposure to pollution and nitrogen deposition is also higher, uh, but they can also experience higher amounts of light availability um, just by virtue of the fact that um, more of these trees are growing in places that are not, where light's not impeded by other trees growing next to them. Uh, and they're also uh, experiencing though higher exposure to pests and pathogens. And this column on the left, I indicate sort of in general, what we might expect a tree's growth response to those different changes in environment to be. And so collectively, we can kind of think of our cities and urbanization as creating this sort of risks, uh, this series of risks and opportunities for tree growth. And really the net response of trees to urbanization is gonna depend on the interactions among these different environmental changes sort of at this, the, the spatial scale of where these trees are. And so I'm going to provide some examples of, of how um, the work that I've been doing and, and some of my colleagues demonstrates how these changes in environment in, in cities might be impacting tree health and potentially the ecosystem services that provide. So I'll start on the one end of the spectrum with, with street trees. So um, uh, some of my colleagues in the lab where I did my postdoctoral work at Boston University, um, they measured hundreds of trees, street trees growing in Boston. And they compared it to trees growing in forests in rural areas of Massachusetts. And um, so that's what I'm showing on the, on the left here. Um, this term DVH is what we call diameter of breast height. It's basically just the diameter of the tree at about 1.4 meters off of the ground. And what you find is that the blue here, which is the urban street trees, for trees of most sizes, those trees are growing considerably faster than a tree of the same size out in a rural forest-like setting. But while these street trees live fast, they also seem to die young. And so this panel on the right is showing sort of the mortality rate of trees of different size categories. And you can see pretty much across the board, no matter how big or small a tree is, in any given year, it is much more likely to die than its friend of the same size out in a rural forest. And, and so I sort of think of, of our street trees as kind of like being like rock stars of the tree world, you know, live fast, die young. Um, and so this is, this is just um, an, an example of sort of one aspect of the urban tree canopy. And there's lots been lots of other studies that show this dynamic where on one hand, our street trees are growing faster in urban areas, but they may also die younger. Now at the other end of the spectrum of our urban tree canopy are our natural forests. Um, and what makes our urban forests uh, quite different than a lot of our rural forests is the fact that they're highly fragmented and, and what we call edgy, meaning a lot of the forest is uh, exposed to um, some sort of land cover type on the edge that's not forest, like a parking lot or a housing development or something like that. And so um, here's some, some data from some research we've been doing in, the, in Massachusetts between urban areas in, the greater, in greater Boston and rural areas in central Massachusetts. 
And these panels on the bottom uh, indicate sort of what the forest landscape looks like uh, from a rural area here um, out in, uh, in central Massachusetts all the way to the heavily urbanized core of, of Boston. And this sort of greenish blue color is forest area. The reddish color is forests that are within 20 meters of an edge, which a lot of our research suggests is about how far uh, into, the, into the forest um, some of the changes in environment that occur uh, by creation of an edge can penetrate. And so these, these changes that I'm talking about are that these forest edges, they tend to be hotter, windier, drier, uh, but also have higher availability to light nutrients. So in a lot of ways, um, these edge environments um, sort of enhance or exacerbate some of the conditions that our cities are also creating. Um, and so as we go from these rural areas to urban areas, a much, much higher proportion of our forests are these like highly fragmented edge exposed forests. And so what we've been wondering is how do, how do these dynamics affect forest growth and its capacity to sequester carbon? Um, and uh, what, is, what might be these, the broader implications for the, the health of these forests moving forward in time? And so the way we do this is we set up a bunch of field plots and we go out and collect tree cores from a lot of different trees in the forest. These are just sort of straw shaped uh, pieces of wood like in the picture on the bottom left here. And we can use this to quantify rates of tree growth uh, and also just overall forest growth. And so this panel that I'm showing you is data from some plots in the greater Boston area. So these are sort of our urban plots. Um, and forest growth here, the metric that we use is basal area. So that's sort of like the amount of radial growth that a tree puts on in every year. Uh, and as you can see, as you go from the forest interior in the blue here to the forest edge in the red, we get about a doubling in how quickly the forest grows and a doubling in how much carbon those forests can remove from the atmosphere. Uh, but when we look at how these forests respond to climate, we find um, uh, a sort of pretty interesting response that we didn't necessarily expect to find. And so what we did is we looked at the number of days during the early part of the growing season that the trees are exposed to heat stress. Um, and in these locations, we define heat stress as days above 27 degrees Celsius. That's the average high temperature in July. So anything above that is sort of like warmer than normal for these trees. Uh, and what we find is that as you go from the interior to the edge, the uh, magnitude of that forest edge growth enhancement uh, declines as heat increases. Um, in other words, uh, the forest edge is growing considerably faster than the interior in cool years, but that difference declines as years get hotter and hotter. And so more recently, what we did is we decided to compare this with forests in rural areas. And what's really interesting is that while we see the same sort of growth response, forests on the edge grow faster than forests in the interior, the sensitivity to heat was not the same. Um, perhaps most notable is that our forest in interior locations um, in, in our rural areas was not particularly sensitive to those hot days in the same way that it was in urban areas. And while that sensitivity to heat did increase um, when you get closer to the edge, that sensitivity was only about one third of what it is in urban areas. And so collectively what this suggests is that there's something about urbanization that while on one hand might be increasing the capacity of trees to grow, it's also increasing how sensitive they are to, to heat and, and, and heat stress. And when we run climate projections moving forward in time, we find that um, as our climate gets hotter, this sort of maybe a little bit of a benefit that we get um, from this forest edge growth enhancement, uh, a lot of that disappears as our climate warms. So what I wanted to just sort of finish up with for the last minute or two here is, um, sort of tying this back to what I guess is the essence of these talks and, and convergence um, and in this session in particular where we think about sort of urban stress across different kingdoms. So the kingdom I focus on is plants, um, but I wanted to think a little bit about what does stress look like for humans uh, like across New York City. And so I preface this with me not at all being a public health expert. Um, but so here's just sort of a, a, a map showing by different neighborhoods in New York City rates of hospitalizations for um, kids that suffer from, from asthma. 
Um, and if we pair that with a spatial map of sort of how hot the city is, we find a lot of, a lot of the areas that are hottest correspond to where we have the highest rates of asthma. Um, and if we look at tree health, I know I'm supposed to finish up, so I'll wrap it up right now. Um, we can look at the nearly 700,000 trees in New York City and um, their locations and how healthy they are and look at um, sort of how health pans out based on congressional district and pair that with things like median household income and we find oops, some overlap between the poorer neighborhoods and poor uh, uh, tree health. Um, we also find the strong correlations between how hot an area is and, um, and the health of the trees in those areas and that relationship is negative. Of course, we don't know which is driving which. Um, but the last slide that I'll have here is just to show that there, there might be some overlap in the places where trees are suffering um, as well as where people are suffering. And these are potentially exciting areas um, to develop new types of convergence research. And so I'm sorry if I'm a few seconds over, but um, I will leave it at that and now I'm done. Thank you, Andy, that was great. Um, and I really like to see, obviously you're uh, reaching out to sort of the public health side of it um, and making those connections and, and drawing the parallels between the two talks already so far that, you know, trees and people both like to be around other trees or people. And, uh, and, and, and like you said, where, where the trees are healthy, maybe the people are healthier and vice versa. Um, so thanks for that. And our next speaker is uh, Monica Trujillo, who is an associate professor in the Department of Biological Sciences and Geology at Queensborough Community College. She received her PhD in biochemistry um, from the Universidad de la Republica in Uruguay. And she's gonna to talk to us today about urban pollution and its impact on microbiota in the soil, which impacts a variety of plants and animals and uh, behavior. Monica. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for being here. Uh, I appreciate very much the opportunity of presenting my research. And I want to start by saying that this um, is the, the descendant of a series of conversations that were held at ASRC on trying to think of how we could use an interdisciplinary approach to try to solve some key biological questions. It was partially driven by <clears throat> the fact that NSF had started this program in which they want scientists to work together to try to answer these questions. And we are like the, the proof of principle of this working group. So our group is led by Erika, who she'll be talking later today. Uh, she's at Brooklyn College, she's a psychologist. Then we have uh, Peter Grothman, who is a um, biogeoscientist at ASRC. He works at the Environmental Initiative. And um, Peter has done extensive work on the effect of urbanization on soil and plants. And I am Monica, I am the microbiologist of the group, and I am the one that works at Queensboro Community College. So when I thought about this talk, I um, decided to look into what, what, how is the scientific community thinking about this problem? And I found this graph that shows how we, our community, the scientists, uh, categorize risks, looking at which are the ones who have the potential of creating a, a generalized crisis. As you can see here, the, the risks uh, are classified based on the color code on different type of risk. Here in blue, we have the environmental risk. In this kind of orangey color, we have the societal risk. It goes all the way from extreme weather to unemployment to terrorism. And the other thing that I think it's important, the home take uh, message in this slide is to understand that not all the risks are the same, right? So they have a different weight. And interestingly, also, we don't know the same about each one of them. So the diameter of the circles are a representation of how much we know. So during these conversations at ARC, and then when the conversation became smaller, when it was Peter and Erica and myself, we decided to focus on what relationship, how we can 
identify the interconnection between the biodiversity loss that happens in our current world with the intersection of what we are making in terms of planning living in cities. I'm not going to add anything to what Sandra said. It was, I mean, much more than what I know, but it is a trend that we are living in cities. And this is the focus of our effort to try to understand what relationship, what is the impact of biodiversity loss into urbanization and what impact does urbanization have on diversity loss. But the real question that we wanted to understand is what impact does it have in human health? And being a microbiologist, um, not surprisingly, I'm interested in, um, I'm sorry, I'm interested in microbes. And um, what I'm what we use as a definition of a microbiome is the combined genetic material of microorganisms in an environment. We are looking at all these small organisms, the one that cannot be seen with the naked eye. So we are looking at small parasites, bacteria, uh, fungi, and viruses. Uh, and the big question that we have is, we do know that there is one environment is the human microbiota. We are going to be looking at the intestine. What interaction does he have with the other environmental environments? So I took a, um, from this review that you are seeing, what these scientists have done is look at what happened before the industrial era. And what we have is that the plant microbiome directly interact with the human microbiome. The feces microbiome, the human microbiome was also exposed to that. And the soil microbiome, there was also an interaction. Now comes hundreds of years of evolution or civilization, and what we have is different. So if you look at the uh, drawing on the right, we do have the same microbiomes, they are still there, but the connection with the human microbiome has been impaired, right? And as you can see, there are many things, not only the result of better hygienic practices, but also the interaction of complete different type of molecules like pept uh, pepticides or, or um, hormones or what we do with the sewage, all of these things play a role. And in between these two very clear moments in our history as living organisms, there is a reduction in richness. So we do have, we do know that there is a reduction in biodiversity. So the first question that we had, and this is the result of a collaboration that I was able to establish with the neuro, uh, Neuroscience Initiative, um, at uh, ASRC, this is the result of the work done with uh, Dr. Jia Liu. We designed an experiment in which we expose mice to soil microbiome. And so in this experiment, you see that we have mice that we first treat with antibiotics. So that means that they become germ-free. After that, we expose them to soil microbiome. And in order to compare a little bit what's happening, we chose two very different soil samples. These samples were uh, made available to us through the generosity of the group of Queen, uh, Queens College who were doing a, a very important work in this area. And they had two soil samples, one coming from a heavily polluted site, Randall Park, in the core of the city, and another <clears throat> soil sample from a very um, isolated park in Long Island. This is the one that we will call as we will call Pristi. It's a way to make sure that we were not looking at the effects due to the contaminant the contaminants in the soil. We sterilize the soil also to use it as a potential control. And by that we know that all the effects are due to whatever is present in the soil as a chemical. And after exposing these mice for two weeks, what we did was we did the testing and um, that was done by, by Gia at ASRC and I characterized the fecal microbiome of these mice. And 
what I'm showing you on the, on the left side is the taxonomy of the fecal microbiome in the mice analyzed. And what I am asking you, I don't have time to go through the, taxon the taxonomy, but look at the rectangle on the left and the one on the right. They are different, right? And what we are proving by this is that, yes, the soil microbiota can determine the mice microbiota. Gia did a series of experiments looking at, looking at the brain of the mice. And what she found was that there was a reduced expression of two myelin glycoprotein transcripts in the mice that were exposed to polluted soil microbiota. So in a way, what I am trying to convince you with this very preliminary result is that yes, we do know that the urban soil microbiota determines the mice microbiota. We do know that the urban soil microbiota has some effect on brain, um, brain gene expression, expression and even more important, there is a trend in behavior, right? What Gia found was that the mice that were exposed to the heavily polluted site had a, a tendency to uh, have a, a depression type of behavior. So this is kind of the proof of principle that whatever happens underground has an effect above the ground. So that is, you probably can see my, my bias uh, as a microbiologist trying to, um, you know, demonstrate that the microbes are important for many other living organisms. So what we wanted, I want to remind you that our project is trying to explore this relationship between the loss of biodiversity impact on urban well-being and how we can change that a little bit depending on the urban planning. Having said that, I want to e explain a little bit about this. So urban planning is made by the citizens who live in a city. And it's crucial that they understand what science has to say about, about urban living so they can make the right connection. And I think that at least I'm not extrapolating, I'm talking about myself. I think that something that is not very easy for me is to communicate what I consider my scientific finding to the rest of the community. And that's one of the things that we wanted to tackle in this interdisciplinary approach. So the case study that we chose, it's based uh, to the fact that I had done some work on this place that is Newtown Creek. Uh, this map shows you where Newtown Creek is. It's one of the more heavily polluted sites in, at least in New York. It's in between Queens and Brooklyn, and it's where the biggest oil spill in the history of the United States ever happened. Um, all these that you see here in gray represents where the oil spill uh, occurred. Why Newtown Creek? Because Newtown Creek also has this great NGO called uh, Newtown Creek Alliance that it's in charge of restoring, revealing, and revitalizing the area. So they are the people who take the leadership in the improvement of this site. And so we thought here we have another interesting member of our group being this NGO that can help us to communicate with the public and to be really able to make a difference for the citizens, the citizen, the people who live in New York. So I want to share with you what our aims are and who is doing the work. So our aim one is to identify the taxonomic and functional profiles of soil and aquatic microbiomes in Newtown Creek. And this is work that I am um, doing and I am engaging my undergraduate students in this. I teach a general microbiology class <clears throat> at Queensboro Community College. And these are the students who have worked with me doing this project. Then Peter's team is going to be responsible of characterizing the processes that are happening in the soil 
and especially looking into what happens in the carbon and nitrogen cycle. Then our aim two, it's led by Erica Steen, and she is working with NCI to look at what are the community perceptions regarding the greening efforts in Newtown Creek. And the second point in our aim is where we are trying to bridge and bring together all the findings that we have. What we want is to be able to share our knowledge with the um, NGO, with the students who participate in this effort, and with the greater community as a whole. And this is where Erica, Peter, myself, and the um, Newton Creek Alliance, we hope to work together. So this is the steps that we will be taking, trying to identify the taxonomic and functional profiles of the soil. So what we have done is we have been able to collect the samples. We have extracted the DNA. The soil is at minus 80, waiting for the restriction, the city to open. And then once we do that, we are going to outsource the sequencing. There's going to come a heavy time of doing sequencing efforts, and we will be able to get this data. This is a picture of my student taking the samples. This represents what the work that Peter is going to do. He's going to focus on microbial respiration to understand uh, the carbon soil. He's going to look at the complex cycle of nitrogen. And this is the work that Erica is going to do. She is going to use focus groups. She's going to use um, online service to try to understand how the community members perceive the social changes that are happening in Newton Creek and the environmental hazards that they are being exposed to. So what are our outcomes? So besides the traditional ones, the publications, we want to be able to have workshops. We want to be able to contribute to some of the things that NCA has. This is, this food web lacks the soil, the microbes. We have here the microbes. We want to bring them in. And obviously we do want to have publications to express, to share this with the scientific community. So the last thing that I have to share with you is my thanks, right? So I am extremely thankful to the conversations that we had, to CUNY by funding our work through the ASLC seed program, to uh, John Dennehy from Queens College by sharing the soil, and to my students who have done a lot of the work. So thank you very much. Thanks, Monica. That's wonderful. Um, we have one more speaker today. Um, Erica Niwa, who is an assistant professor of psychology at Brooklyn College. Uh, she received her PhD in applied developmental psychology from New York University. And today I believe she's talking to us about social and psychological development of adolescents that reinforce inequality. Okay, thank you so much. Let me just share my screen. And I want to thank, of course, um, all the wonderful uh, speakers and others. Let's see, can everybody see okay? Okay. Um, and of course, thank you to my colleague, uh, Monica, and to others. Um, and actually, I think it's, it's really wonderful to kind of see the full circle, starting with Dr. Galea, to um, coming back to, um, I'll be speaking a bit about human beings again. Um, but I wanted to thank you all for having me, and I wanted to talk a little bit, not about the Newtown Creek Project, but another project to think about how we might um, use community-engaged research to promote our science goals. Um, and for me, I'm, an ad I'm a developmental psychologist, so that's thinking about positive use development, but I think it'll hopefully be meaningful for all of us studying urban spaces at all different scales of life. Um, so what I thought I'd do is, um, uh, mention this moment in history that we're all living through at this moment um, and talk about uh, some of my disciplinary approaches to this work. And then I thought I'd raise a few questions that have come up across my work um, that I think will be meaningful for all of us as we think about um, how to make our science be um, uh, meaningful to the communities in which we are embedded. And finally, I'll end with talking about a project that I run 
which tries to really reimagine what community engaged research and education might look like with the Brooklyn College Community Partnership. So starting in mid-March, um, our streets in New York City emptied out as the global pandemic of COVID-19 swept through. And clearly that COVID-19 has deeply impacted each of us, our students, our communities, um, and our city and people around the world. But from these empty streets, our streets are packed and full with people protesting and calling for racial justice and equity. Yesterday, the New York City Department of Health actually said that racism is a public health crisis. Um, and we're on, I believe, day 10 or day 11 of sustained protesting across New York City, the country, and the world. And of course, um, these protests emerge out of a, an incredibly long history of racial injustice, um, but were catalyzed by the murder and the death of George Floyd, a black man in Minneapolis by a white police officer. Um, he is, George Floyd though, is of course one in a long string of people who have lost their lives, uh, black people in this country who have lost their lives or been um, assaulted um, because, of, uh, because of being black. And um, as part of this movement, I'm sure many of you are aware, there's a movement to say their names, right? To kind of, as we talk about the broad structural issues to also center the humanity of the people whose lives were lost. So I have some of their names, although there are too many to name. So George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, Ahmed Arbery, Tamir Rice, Sandra Bland, Trayvon Martin, Eric Garno, Fernando Castile, Michael Brown, Rakia Boyd, Kayla Moore, Atatiana Jefferson, and so many more. Um, and I know I'm just gonna say I'm a psychologist, so I know we are all feeling lots of things, usually in rapid succession and often simultaneously. And I know that we're also bringing this to our work here um, and especially in urban spaces and I know with us today. Um, and lest we think that empty streets and full streets are not connected, they are. Um, we actually, uh, preliminary data is illustrated already that even the spread of COVID-19 is associated with uh, structural inequities. Um, so just some examples are that uh, Black people in the United States are much more likely to get COVID-19 and more likely to die from it. Maps of the spread of the uh, virus across the city indicate that it's particularly intense um, in low-income and Black and brown communities. Um, so uh, I start with all of this because this is where we are, um, but also because much of my own work as a developmental psychologist has focused on the social mechanisms by which adolescents and young people um, experience racism and inequality and how that shapes their pathways over time. And in particular, my work has focused on racial discrimination and ethnic and political violence um, with a focus on also kind of uh, civic engagement and change. So what I thought I'd do is raise a couple of questions when I, uh, when I think about these questions with human beings. And I know that um, it's quite different than talking about trees and, and uh, microbiomes, but uh, Monica and I have a lot of experience with trying to figure out how to have conversations across lots of scientific languages. Um, um, but so first, as we do our work in urban spaces, um, it's important to question our most basic conceptualizations and definitions of the constructs and ideas that we hold most close to us. So as an example, example, I wanted to share how developmental psychologists use the term ecology and ecological systems, which uh, may be vastly or not maybe will be vastly different than some of how you might define ecosystems and ecological systems. Um, but I hope that it really highlights the importance of questioning our own starting points in our research. Um, in developmental psychology, we uh, typically use Yuri Brenner's model, which he borrowed from other scientists, um, to examine and think about uh, what he called ecological systems theory, that it is impossible to understand human development at, in a vacuum and outside of the different multiple levels of, uh, of context in which human beings are embedded. And this extends from the microsystem, which is that smallest level, which are both settings like home, school, and neighborhoods, and relationships like with family and peers, and extends out to the macro system, which are what he argues are things like the overarching beliefs and values of a society, like the idea of the American dream or of white supremacy, for example. Um, and that there are intermediary systems and processes in between, including the exosystem, which are the system, systems and institutions that, in, that kind of uh, structure these, the larger values, as well as the intersections between them. Um, and that there's a broad range of research that tells us that the groups that we are members of in society are often given uh, 
value, so in the United States, things around race, for example, that impact all levels of the ecological systems through which we move and that these are heightened in context of oppression, inequality, or conflict. Um, and this focus on the ecological context also urges, makes us kind of have to focus on the role of power in this process. Um, and this is particularly important for all of us to consider as we do our work in urban settings, because uh, power and marginalization are part of the story of the ways that cities are structured. When you look at the, um, the density of urban trees um, to the cleanliness of soil. Um, in developmental psychology, we talk about marginalization as this multidimensional, dynamic, context-dependent, and diverse web of processes rooted in power imbalance and systematically directed towards specific groups and individuals with probabilistic implications for development. You might imagine that you could put in all kinds of different um, words from your own fields and you might see these, how these multiple layers of systems are intersecting. I would urge us and urge all of us outside of this space as well that many of us who do work like this with youth um, use the phrase youth experiencing marginalization rather than marginalized youth in order to think about um, um, that these processes may be external but, uh, but are not necessarily inherent or internal and therefore unmovable and within individuals. And when we make that shift from thinking about these processes of power and context as being um, not just internal and therefore unchangeable within human beings that allows for the capacity to think about change and development. Um, so I'm going to give an example from um, adolescent research. Um, oftentimes when people study teenagers and adolescents, we usually think about them as being the problem or the victim. Um, I'm a mother of an 11 year old and sometimes they are the problem and sometimes they are the victim. Um, but what's often missing from the literature and what's been expanding in the literature is a focus on adolescents as being active agents also in shaping their own development and that of their communities. Um, and so I wanted to take these three ideas in, and return it back to the idea of this webinar overall, which is the mandate of convergence research in general, um, to really think about these big, vexing, wicked research problems that uh, society faces and to think about how using a deeply integrated transdisciplinary approach, we can really um, uh, uh, expand our scientific discovery and catalyze innovation in the ways that we think about this work. Um, so I thought I might describe a, a project that I'm doing to think about how we might reimagine community engaged research. I say community engaged and not based on purpose. Um, so I am the uh, faculty director and the PI of the Brooklyn College Community Partnership, um, which I like to think of uh, as, which I'll call BCCP. I like to think about it as a research education service incubator. So trying to think about where all these different parts of the work that we do meet together. Um, and uh, our focus is broadly, um, to address inequity and support marginalized youth um, in the context of after school, um, but while developing sustained and authentic connections between Brooklyn College and the surrounding community. And um, we think about this work as public facing, and I just, you'll probably notice I use the word we instead of I, and that's because when you engage in community engaged research, I may be the PI, but it is, a, it is a big we that does the work from the young people in the programs to my undergraduates, et cetera. So in this work, we actually think about our, uh, the different pieces as being connected and housed, oops, sorry, housed within each other. So we have uh, two ongoing research projects. One is an ongoing study of the developmental processes. One is a pr program evaluation, meaning research in the efforts to support programs on the ground in communities. I also have my students from my research lab do this community engaged research, so they are embedded in these uh, sites with young people. We have an education component, and these are, they look like they're separate, but they are all interlaced. Um, we have an education component, so much of our grant funding goes to running free after school programs for diverse youth, which I'll talk about in a moment. Um, and I also teach undergraduate courses that are community engaged fieldwork courses where my undergrads are then placed in the, set, the sites and settings as well. And we provide extensive community support with professional development to direct service youth workers, to the other researchers and to the students and youth as well as job opportunities and growth. Um, just from a programmatic perspective, we just so you can understand the scale, we provide free um, STEAM based, so that's science, tech, engineering, art and math 
so the creativity mixed with science, tech, engineering, and math, um, in after school programs for about 1,000 middle school and high school students across different sites in predominantly low income, low resource uh, communities across Brooklyn, as well as participatory college access programming to our college campus. And um, after schools are incredibly important spaces for young people outside of the structures of the school day. And why STEM? Why do we focus on that in particular? Well, when we think about these big issues of racism, we also know that um, ethnic minority students are far less likely to get the training that they need when they're in K through 12 in STEM fields that emerges from educational inequity. And yet when they do, it's a beautiful thing. It leads to all kinds of incredible growth, um, both personally and academically, but also in terms of their, their lifetime career pathways. And we know that Black and Latinx people are deeply underrepresented in STEM fields, and there's still inequities there that we need to think about as we do our own science. Um, and actually, there's a movement, I, I just got an email that there's a movement called um, hashtag shutdown STEM for tomorrow to think about um, the experiences of Black researchers in science. Um, but as we think about this, so you can see that as we kind of think about how to structure these interlaying projects, um, we have our, of course, our research objectives um, and our educational objectives, but in order to think about how they come together, we try to um, intentionally create other opportunities for the overlap between them. And for us, that means thinking about authentic opportunities for youth and community members to be engaged in the research process. That includes what are the things that they are most curious about? What do they want to know about? What are the questions they would ask? Some of the translational issues that Monica was raising. So how do we institute research practice feedback loops in which our research findings are shared with and translated and validated by community members and also that programs might be um, reciprocally influ influenced by our research finding. Oh, these were just my, this slide looks a little out of place, but these are our overarching, my own research goals for what the study is that we are doing and some of the wonderful young people in our program. Um, and so I wanted to end with, so why might we wanna focus on this type of approach? Well, it helps us to extend our scientific knowledge. I'm just have some for what my own research science, uh, research questions are, but it helps to extend our knowledge. It helps us to actually think about our role in the CUNY system as a public institution that serves broadly diverse students and communities and including them in the process of research and education in really meaningful ways, while also thinking about um, those, uh, uh, the, the boundaries and borders between the colleges ourselves, uh, themselves and the spaces and communities in which they are embedded. Um, and I thought maybe where I would end um, is on, um, uh, a couple of questions that I thought we might continue to ask ourselves um, as uh, scientists across a broad range of disciplines who are really trying to understand these issues in the beautiful mess of the urban context that we live in, uh, the wonderful things, the challenging things, and everything in between. Um, and many of these are also drawn from my work with young people. So these are the questions that young people themselves will often ask me and say, this is what I wish scientists would ask. Some is, um, when I talk to high school students, they often want to know who is asking the questions and who are they for. So I would urge us all to think about how do we think about who's asking the questions and how can we engage more people in that process. Um, what happens when we interrogate our most basic assumptions about the ways that things work, right? And oftentimes the best way to do that and see those things is by um, having to engage in conversations with non-scientists or others outside of our disciplines. And part of that too, um, to go back to the idea of what, is it, what does the word, a word like ecology even mean, is how do we find new language that authentically brings together different scientists and disciplines, and even more difficult, how do we, or, and exciting, is how do we create research spaces that are no, not only accessible and translational to broader communities, but may allow for communities and non-scientists to bring their own expertise and their own knowledge of their communities um, into our own questions and labs. And um, with ultimately the question being, how can our science act as a lever of transformative change? Um, I have to thank my, all the young people who I work with and um, my others, but I wanted to end and leave up there a quote um, from Bell Hooks, who's a, a well-known kind of intellectual thinking about these issues. I'd started with marginalization, but I thought maybe we could shift the definition a little bit. She says, the margin is more than a site of deprivation. It is also the site of radical possibility, a space of resistance, a site one stays in, clings to even because it nourishes one's capacity to resist, 
It offers to one the possibility of radical perspective from which to see and create, to imagine alternatives and new worlds. And it's been a real pleasure to hear all the speakers um, because I actually can hear and imagine lots of new worlds and alternatives in the, in the important work that's being done. And I really, I wanted to thank the ASRC as well for your support in this, this type of work. Thank you. Thank you, Erica. Um, really appreciate that wonderful talk. Um, I think all of our speakers actually, what, it was a fantastic session. Uh, so thank you, Erica, Monica, Andy, Sandro. Um, and uh, I'm just sort of, I have so many questions running through my head. I just want to remind everybody that the chat should be enabled now. So you should feel free to begin asking questions. Um, oh, we're seeing presenter mode, sorry. Let me unshare my screen and do this again. Is this better? I hope. Okay, um, great. So questions, um, anybody who would like to please feel free to submit a question through the chat. Um, I'll get started with, uh, with something quickly, if I can. Um, so what's clear really from the talks is that we're not really just talking about the urban environment, we're talking about multiple micro environments within cities. Um, some of those micro environments are gonna have access to more green spaces that are gonna be further away from sites of pollution. They're gonna have high quality schools in the neighborhood. And we know that minorities tend to be excluded um, or lack access to those types of neighborhoods. They tend to be in places uh, with fewer assets as Sandra would say. Um, so, so Sandra, I wanted to kind of put you on the spot a little bit. You mentioned in your talk, you were willing to say if there was one thing, it's social connections that would increase um, health outcomes. But pick what's one thing, if you had to pick one thing, what would it be in terms of reducing the impact of inequality on health outcomes in, in urban centers? Just an easy question. Yeah, well, <clears throat> the answer obviously is. Um, <laughs> So I have two answers to that, if I may. Um, um, I think it depends on your analytic lens. I think if your analytic lens is an instrumental one, which is perhaps a more proximal one, I would say I would focus on assets because I think assets, differential assets, and by assets, I, I mean assets expansively. People saw that. I don't just mean money. I mean wealth. I mean income. I mean education, I mean environmental assets, I mean it's a full range of assets. That's if I were to be more proximal. If I were to be more distal, if I were to be more distal, I then I think you need to focus on power and politics because I actually think that power and politics set the structures within cities and not within cities. And I think Professor Niwa's uh, presentation did a terrific job of actually highlighting this, thank you. Um, um, I thought um, uh, it illustrated nicely sort of how the downstream consequences that are directly linked. You can connect the straight line dots um, uh, from uh, what uh, you presented to power and politics. So I think it depends where you answer it. I think the, the only problem with saying power and politics, which I think is correct, is that it's sort of abstract, right? It's like, it's, like, it's like abstract and it's like, well, what are we doing about that? So I think it's fair to label that. But I think if you want to be instrumental, which leads to fairly practicable policy solutions, I would think it's assets. I would actually be interested in what Professor Niva thinks about this, just because uh, it's directly linked to her presentation. Erica, do you want to add? Yeah. Sure. I um, thank you so much. I uh, I actually think it is a combination of the two, and um, and in fact, um, uh, one of the challenges. So when we have these conversations with young people, for example, about um, um, inequities in in uh, healthcare, for example, or um, or some of these broader healthcare issues are, I'm thinking across all of these, even for example, um, uh, access to clean food or how we might engage with issues in around climate science and equity, right? And, and how inequality shapes all these processes. There is very much this need to take, uh, to, to kind of go, to go what you call distal and proximal, to be able to move between those two. Um, I, I think it is a, a matter of where you drop into it, but I think it's also, um, uh, 
I don't think that, I don't see one as being more important than the other, but rather that they kind of have to go hand in hand, right? You have to be able to, to zoom out and see the, the big issues as they happen and to name them as you see them, um, but also to really drill in and think about, for example, um, the ways that uh, food scarcity might impact a, a very specific community might be important, as well as understanding the, broad, the broader issues that have led to it. Actually, I, if I just, may just say, I thought this is a perfect elaboration what I said, because you're right, because I sort of said, well, one or the other, depending on your lens. What Professor Nee was saying, yes, but actually it should be an and, not an or, which, which I- Yes, which, I appreciate. I think the and is great. Yeah, I, 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 I agree. I didn't think of it that way. Thank you. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Um, so from the chat, uh, we have a question for Erica. Is community-engaged research the same as participatory research in the way they engage subjects of research to design and execute the studies? Um, they are very similar. Um, they are, I wouldn't really think of them as mutually exclusive. So participatory action research, of which there's actually a lot of great work that comes out of the Graduate Center at CUNY, for example, um, uh, really tries to reframe the entire research endeavor so that um, those who are thought of as the experts are um, are kind of it's democratized. Um, so that is a part of it. Um, oftentimes, when we think about when I think about um, I think about community engaged research as kind of a level more abstract than participatory. So participatory action research is about kind of the the mechanisms by how you would collect the data. The community engaged research is about um, uh, at least for me the kind of long term sustained engagement in a community. So Lots of psychologists, for example, will drop in and do a study and then leave. Um, and so community engaged research is about the sustained relationship over time and over often many years um, or a lifetime. Um, but they are, I, I, um, they, uh, they are, they kind of all go hand in hand, um, although there's lots of ways for them to, they, they are complementary in lots of different ways. Wonderful, thanks. Uh, I mean, I think the the amount of community engaged research is picking up so much and it's such an important part of the CUNY research community and the way it interacts with its local communities. And I really see that as so instrumental and necessary in terms of trying to make the kinds of changes and, and, and bring about the type of social change that we need in order to address inequality. So I think it's really important. Um, Chad is taking me in a new direction, which is to Andy. Um, how much could the current tree cover in New York City be expanded realistically? Would it be enough to make a difference in terms of temperature and in terms of, of people's health? So that is a great question. I have um, yet to delve into looking at sort of all the different places where we could potentially plant more trees. A lot of this sort of work was done um, prior to the Million Trees Project and most of those trees were planted in uh, sort of ex existing parks. Um, what I will say is, is that, so at the city scale, less than 20% of the city is covered with, with tree canopy. Um, what we might want to think about doing is, particularly in residential neighborhoods, is think about ways that we might be able to expand not just the number of trees that we plant, but sort of rethink um, the way we go about planting them and how big of a cutout we want in a sidewalk because it's not sort of just the number of trees but we want those trees to sort of live fast but not die young uh, and attain large sizes because the ecosystem services will sort of scale exponentially with with tree size and um, so New York City Department of Public Health has a uh, I forget exactly the name of the program maybe it's like the hot neighborhoods program or something like that and one of the things that they're that they're exploring is sort of what's the capacity of of uh, new tree plantings in helping to cool off those neighborhoods. So I, I don't have a good answer at, at the, the scale of, of New York City, which is which is massive. But I think there are certainly communities that are uh, hotter than sort of maybe the, the norm for New York City, and we could target those uh, to increase canopy cover. The other piece that I'll add here is, you know, especially for lots of Manhattan where you have 50 plus story buildings, planting a little, you know, 10 foot tall tree along the street is not going to do a, a whole lot. And so, you know, I think our thinking can go sort of beyond just trees and think about um, green roofs and things along those lines. Um, a few years ago, the city had an initiative to incentivize painting roofs white, which is a cheap way to kind of cool things off. Uh, and if you look at our building at the ASRC, you can see a lot of white roofs across Harlem. Um, and when we look at the land surface temperature data, you can see the cooling effect that that has had. So I think 
um, sort of these multitude of approaches mm -hmm. of planting trees where we can, um, lightening the color of roofs where we can, and maybe uh, increasing sort of the, the area of green roofs. Maybe in, in conjunction, those can probably have a pretty large and meaningful impact on, on temperature, uh, certainly at the residential scale where it's going to impact people the most. Great. Um, just out of curiosity, would you say that there's a city that is going about its urban planning initiatives with these things squarely in mind and, and actually laying out a, a sensible future for that? So I, I, I don't, I don't is there know. An I, ideal we should follow? Yeah, you know, the, there, there's no other New York really in the U.S., right? You know, we're considerably denser than any other city. And so it's really hard to draw those comparisons. Like Atlanta has almost 50% canopy cover, but its population density is a fraction of what New York's is. Like we're not gonna get New York to 50% canopy cover unless we start planting trees on tops of, of buildings. Um, but I think that there's sort of a, a more intelligent way that we can think about planting trees and greening up moving forward. This is a, a opportunity and a problem that lots of cities confront, right? Like everybody wants to sort of green up their cities for a variety of reasons. A lot of the ecosystem services that, that I, I mentioned, um, but I think we also need to think about the fact that our urban areas are already harsh environments and that's going to get harsher as the climate warms uh, and not all tree species um, survive and respond the same to those conditions. Um, we recently got funding from, from NOAA to explore sort of what might be some of these unintended consequences of, of planting different species. So um, trees in response to heat stress produce uh, these uh, biogenic volatile organic compounds called isoprene. Um, when they're really hot, they release these, these gases and um, that this thought to help kind of like increase the rigidity of the cells under high temperatures. But these are also important precursors for ground level ozone pollution and certain trees produce more of these than others. And so I think in addition to just greening, we want to be careful with, you know, what are the trees that, that we're planting? Are they going to survive future conditions? Are they going to have a suite of unintended consequences? Do they require a whole lot of water? And how much do we care about that if you're in a city in a place where water is more, more limiting? So I know that's not a perfect answer to, to, your, to your question, but I think New York has a lot of unique challenges that, you know, are sort of opportunities uh, moving forward. Great. Thanks very much. Um, Monica, a question for you. Uh, are there initial or future plans to target specific contaminants in soil, feces, sewage, or animal systems? Could these studies benefit your genetic or gene ex expression studies? Yes, so I, I didn't have time to go through it, but what we um, believe is that um, the way through which some of these effects uh, that, um, that the soil microbiome has on the intestine of other animals, it's mediated by a particular type of proteins, uh, sorry, of, of um, molecules that are, produ that are produced by a group of microorganisms. Um, and that's also part of the reason why we chose to study Newtown Creek because Newtown Creek, because it's so heavily polluted with oil, it has a higher proportion of uh, a type of microorganisms that produce sphingolipids. Sphingolipids are uh, mo molecules that are used for signaling across kingdoms. So it's quite interesting because you don't find these universal signal molecules. In general, they are more specific for one kingdom or, or another one. So that's one of the things that we are specifically interested in, uh, to study that group of microorganisms and what impact they can have. And so I didn't have time to share that, but we did find that our mice that were infected with these heavily polluted uh, sites um, soil, uh, soil from polluted sites uh, had a greater proportion of these microbes that are able to produce these signaling molecules. So we do have some indications that, yes, not, not surprisingly, that not all bacteria are the same and that uh, we want to be able to dissect and to try to identify which are the ones that we want to focus on. Great, thank you. 
Um, I think this is going to be all the time that we have for questions during the Q&A so that there's enough time for our breakout rooms. Um, so I just want to quickly give you some instructions for the breakout rooms, which is um, there's going to be four of them as indicated here. Each speaker is going to have their own room. You can let us know which breakout you want to um, join by changing your name to include the number before your name. And so the way that you want to do that is you want to hover over the participants um, icon in the menu that's either at the bottom or the top of your screen. Click on that and then find your name. You click on more, it says rename, and then you can just type the number in in front of your name and click OK. And then what we'll do is just automatically segregate you into those rooms. So as you're doing that, I just want to invite Patricia um, to give any closing remarks that she'd like to add before we do break up. Okay, so first of all, thank you to everybody for amazing uh, dialogue and amazing debate. I think that uh, being CUNY, the largest urban city university, I think it's really appropriate to discuss the effect of urbanization on health. And so we heard just from Professor Galea, the fact that by 2050, we can expect six billions of people in the city. Just as a reminder, we, we discussed a lot of uh, potential contributors to health and how perhaps we may want to think of shifting the debate from curing the sick to promoting the healthy ones. And, uh, and to address how the cities can do that, we identified the potential issues, including spaces, assets, stressors, and social connection. And, uh, uh, and we heard also in the general theme of, uh, of the webinar, which was convergence. So we heard about margins being those uh, margins between city and forests, being margins between society, being uh, the, the line that we should, we're seeing in, in Detroit between uh, um, racial divides. And, uh, and we heard also about ecology from um, multiple level of exceptions from uh, microbes and ecological system of the soil to ecology of, of the population. So um, I just think that uh, I would like to thank all of you and uh, perhaps in the breakout room, we can really try to address how can we make a positive change in our city to health and to our communities and perhaps to our environment. Thank you again, and we'll see you in the breakout rooms. Great, thank you. And uh, as everybody's going, I'll just remind you that we have our fourth webinar on June 23rd. We're also gonna have a Twitter poster session that day. If you wanna participate, please, please register by June 12th. And we'll be uh, providing a report of the series to everybody uh, in July.